Joining us today on Superheroes of Science, we're pleased to welcome Erica Carlson. Erica is a theoretical physicist and 150th anniversary professor of physics and astronomy at Purdue University. She's also a fellow of the American Physical Society. So we're very happy to have you today, Erica. Thanks for having me. Uh, where do we begin? Well, I, I'm a little curious about how one becomes a fellow of the American Physical Society. There you go. Oh, okay. So the American Physical Society is our professional organization of physicists. There are at least 10,000 of us just in my subfield, so thousands and thousands of physicists. And so the way you become a fellow of any of these academic organizations is that one of your colleagues, actually in this case four, nominate you um, and explain what research you've done that was um, you know, groundbreaking enough to, to merit becoming a fellow of the society. And then there's a selection process, just like there is for any type of um, uh, merit-based uh, award. And then, uh, and then if you make that, that cut, then you're a, a fellow of the, of the society. And so I'm very grateful to have been nominated by colleagues for that and to have uh, been named a fellow. So what research was it that you had uh, been working on? Well, we uh, have worked on a, a lot of different things. That particular award was for studies on the connection between um, electron pneumatics and superconductors. So superconductors are materials that can conduct electricity without losing any energy. And an electron pneumatic is a rather crazy Thing that electrons can do inside of solids where the electrons kind of spontaneously form little ladders. So if you can imagine little nanoscale ladders inside of a material, um, that's, that's what we were studying is the connection between those and superconductivity. Oh, wow. uh, so, it, and I've heard of superconductivity before, but I, I, I won't say that I could tell someone exactly what it meant. I mean, it's kind of one of those things I've heard of, but it's, it, it, could you Explain that just a little bit better for me and the people like me. Sure. So uh, you're probably more familiar with metals because you encounter metals in your everyday life. Anytime you look around and you see something that's shiny with the right sheen, you probably notice it's a metal like the hinges here on the door are metal. Or if you have a power cord, as I'm sure you do, the little prongs coming out are metallic and the cord inside is, is metallic. Something that's metallic conducts electricity very well. So if you put a voltage on it, the electrons flow through the material very well, and that's what makes it, it metallic. Now, uh, metals aren't perfect at that, however. So whenever metals are conducting electricity, they're actually always losing a little bit of energy all the time. And the way you could measure this was if you had, for example, really sensitive infrared goggles. I'm sure you guys have some. Uh, so, <laughs> you, you know, you can, you can look basically at heat coming off of things is what that allows you to do, right? Um, so if you, if you had sensitive enough infrared goggles, you would see that all the power cords in your house that are plugged in and drawing any electricity are actually a little bit hot. As we're, okay, so what that's showing you is that while they're conducting electricity, they're also generating heat. And that's kind of annoying because you'd like to have all the power that you pay for from the power company go into powering your device. And yet a lot of it is basically leaking out as heat into the environment. And so metals are good conductors, but they're not perfect conductors. If you had a perfect conductor, it could carry current without losing any energy. And that's what superconductors do. So hence the super name. And so superconductors are actually a very special uh, state of what electrons can do inside of a material. And uh, when they're in that state, which actually um, works because of, of quantum mechanics, there's a, um, uh, a, a trick that the electrons do to pull this off, but they actually go into uh, a state where they can move from, the electrons can move from one side of the sample to the other without bumping into anything in the material and without losing any energy as they go from one side to the other. And uh, that's, that's a superconductor. So you can imagine if we had these operating at room temperature, that would be very exciting. So I've worked a lot on what's called cuprate high temperature superconductors. They operate um, in, you know, just above maybe 100 Kelvin uh, at, at uh, ambient pressure, which is still cold to humans, right? Um, yeah. Very cold from, from a human standpoint. 
Um, although if you've ever played with liquid nitrogen, that's plenty cold enough for, for those to operate. Liquid nitrogen operates at 77 Kelvin. There was a report though, just a couple of weeks ago in the journal Nature of uh, superconductivity happening at almost room temperature. So pretty, pretty close, um, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit out of a, a material that uh, was under extreme pressure though. It's not, it's not ready for the big time as far as applications go. And of course it was the first published report. And so we're all kind of waiting with bated breath to see if other labs can reproduce it, mm -hmm. right? That's one of the steps of the scientific method. It's not enough for one lab to report it. We kind of reserve judgment until we see that other labs are getting the same thing so that we know that there wasn't a mistake somehow in those original measurements. But that's actually pretty exciting news. So I hope that I hope that that result stands and that other labs confirm that result. Oh, thank you. That is so exciting. Yes, I agree. That'll be fun to watch. <laughs> and, and you can imagine if you could pull this off at room temperature and at ambient pressure, right? The, the, dis the discovery uh, of that, that made the news a couple of weeks ago is under such extreme pressures. It's like being at the center of the earth. It's not out here, you know, where, where we humans can interact with it. But if you could make things like that happen at ambient temperature and at ambient pressure, meaning room temperature and room pressure, you could go a long way towards solving the energy crisis. Because think about it, everything in your house or in your uh, office or your school that draws electricity, all those electrical power lines are leaking energy all the time and even the power lines that carry the power from the power plants into our homes and businesses and schools they are leaking power all the time so if we could replace those with superconductors that leak no energy we'd go a long way towards solving the energy crisis that that's awesome well now so getting to your research i know we've talked before and you now, let me think, you work in theoretical research, is that correct? And that there's a difference between the type of research you do and I wanna say experimental research. So could you talk a little about maybe the re types of research you do and how it's different from the other? I feel like there's, there's like a, a dichotomy there, there's two different. Yes, yes, there are, there are two different uh, uh, branches in physics. Uh, some groups do theoretical research, some groups do experimental research. And what we mean by that, if somebody's doing experimental research, they have a laboratory with equipment in it, and they go in and they measure objects, <laughs> and they find out the way that the world really works, okay? And so they publish data that they have taken using equipment on materials or, or other things. Um, if you're doing theoretical physics, then you're using either mathematics that you write down by hand or uh, mathematics that you carry out on a computer, it could be computer code. And so those are, are, what you're doing there is you're working out the way you think the world should be, right? So, so basically, this is, these are the two, roughly speaking, the two halves of the scientific method, right? So there's lots of articulation of the scientific method, but they all fall roughly into, into two pieces. Number one, have an idea. Number two, test it against measurements you take in a laboratory. And then you can repeat as much as you need. You can go back and make a better idea now, and then you can test that against the data. And then you can make a better idea and test that against experimental data. It's an iterative process that gets you closer and closer to the truth over time. And But you need those two halves. So that, that, the have an idea part that is theory. That's where we're working out the mathematics or uh, doing some computer simulations about we think this object moves this way or in, in my case I work on materials so I think this material works this way. Then I make predictions that somebody can then test in a laboratory. So they go into a laboratory and they make measurements and then they'll see whether the theory applies to that system. Very cool. Perfect, because you do hear about the different, the experimental versus theoretical. Yeah. You hear about that in the news, and so having someone explain that is uh, good mm -hmm. for us to be able to know. And I, I don't think as a student I ever understood that theoretical side of it, that there, that, that was a big part of it, I, because I think our uh, interactions, you know, from an early age are in the laboratory where we are taking those measurements and seeing, so it's interesting to hear about that other side of it. Yeah, and, and the part of the labs that you did where you had to write a calculation down, that was the theory side, right? So you had to write some calculations to see if it matched 
Yeah. And, you know, I should say uh, that, that when you're talking about taking, um, I said, experimental data, not all, so ex when we say experiment, we actually mean we're going to be able to control a little bit about the setup. So in fact, there are some branches of physics, uh, I'm sorry, there are some branches of science that can't do that. So for example, astrophysics or astronomy, they don't get to actually set up the experiment. So we call that observational. They make observations, right? So they still use uh, instruments to record data about the natural world. That's the key to that piece of the scientific method. It's either observational or experimental, but you use instruments to take data about natural phenomena. And then that's the piece where you're testing how the world actually works. Oh, well, I guess. That, and that makes sense. And it's because that's the first thing we do with, with students is we look at observations to make inferences. Right. And so this, this uh, in your case, you have to prove the inferences. Uh, so, <laughs> or support the inferences, I should say, not prove. Yeah, exactly. Yes, good point. <laughs> no, I don't want to create a misconception unintentionally there. <laughs> It's uh, states of matter. I know that we were going to also discuss some states of matter and, uh, and how that ties in so we understand where we're going with that. So uh, I'll let you take it over. I'm doing a lousy job asking questions. So, so my research right now focuses on understanding what electrons do in solids, specifically in solids that we call quantum materials. They have some sort of aspect to them. Uh, where the quantum properties come to the forefront in a way that makes them um, uh, do special things, okay? We can, we can do new tricks with quantum materials than we can with, with uh, uh, you know, previously known materials. So basically, my field of research, the larger umbrella is called condensed matter physics, which we mean condensed in the sense of condensation, as in gas condenses to liquid, liquid condenses to solid. So we're really about phases of matter and phase transitions. And you are familiar with lots of phases of matter already. I have a glass of ice water here. So I have in here liquid and I have in here solid and actually gathering on the outside of the glass are little water droplets that are condensing from the gas phase in the air uh, into liquid phase on the outside of the, the glass. So here I have it all, right? All those phase transitions represented. Um, but in fact, there's many more phases of matter than solid liquid gas. So if you have any uh, electronic device that has an LCD display, LC, it's, you probably do right in front of you right now. Yeah, look at one. <laughs> yeah, any, any of your smartphones or laptops incorporate this. Um, and uh, so LCD stands for liquid crystal display. It's something that's in between a liquid and a crystal. Liquids flow in all directions. Crystals have a regular repeating structure to the atoms inside of them. Crystals are, are solids, okay? And, but something that's a liquid crystal is both at the same time. So you can get liquid crystal phases where something can flow in one direction, but not in the other. Or maybe something can flow really well, but it has trouble turning corners. And there are actually a lot of different liquid crystal phases of matter. If you want to look them up, some of their names are smectics or pneumatics, hexatics, cholesterics, there are others. Um, and so these are phases that are intermediate between liquid and uh, solid. And there, there are a, a lot of other phases of matter as well. You may have heard of superfluids or Bose-Einstein condensate. So a superfluid would be um, a liquid that has lost all of its viscosity. Okay, so I have here, I'll get my water out again. So I have my water and it's got a particular viscosity to it. Actually, uh, the ice is going to get in the way. But imagine I didn't have any ice in there. And, you know, I can kind of stir the, the water up and I feel... And I can feel the water, but it's pretty easy for me to, to stir the water if the ice wasn't in the way. If I did that with a cup of honey, it would be harder, right? So imagine I have a jar of honey and I'm going to stir the honey around. Honey is much more viscous, okay? There's a state of matter called superfluid. Uh, and so one of the places this happens is if you take helium-4 atom and nuke them really cold around 4 Kelvin above absolute zero, they become a superfluid. It's a fluid that has zero viscosity. So if you can imagine, if I had a vat of superfluid helium and I stuck my finger in, don't do that because it's too cold. Maybe use a stick, but we'll just imagine. So you imagine sticking your finger in and stirring it and it has no viscosity at all. So what would it feel like? It would feel like nothing. <laughs> Okay, you, you, you can't push on it. It doesn't even push back. So that's a superfluid. So there are lots of phases of matter beyond solid, liquid, and gas. And then I specifically study what electrons do inside of solids. 
And it turns out that electrons inside of materials have their own phases of matter and phase transitions. So we talked before about metals. Metals conduct electricity. So, you know, you have a metal in any of your power cords, right? If you, I don't recommend this unless you don't need the cord anymore, but if you cut it and looked inside, you would see there's copper wires in there and they're metallic. They, they are what conducts electricity. So if you put voltage on a metal, the electrons flow. So something that flows, is that more like a solid or a liquid? It's Ooh, a, liquid. a liquid, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's exactly mathematically how we describe those electrons in a metal. We describe them as a liquid. We call it a Fermi liquid, if you want to look that up. Um, but it's a liquid. Uh, you know, they could do other things. If I take something that's insulating, like, you know, take a hunk of plastic or a hunk of wood and put a voltage on it, the electrons don't flow in that material. They're much more solid like there. So there really are phases of matter and phase transitions that electrons have inside of solids. And you know, maybe, maybe a really fun one to think about is magnetism. I, I, I bet everyone listening to this has played with magnets at some point. I was just playing with magnets with my dad last night. I'm, I'm visiting my, my parents right now. And so uh, you know, in this house, we all love playing with magnets. I hope you do too. But magnets are when the electrons are doing something very specific in the material. They have little atomic scale magnetic moments that are arising due to quantum mechanics. And when those little magnetic moments all align, you get a permanent magnet. But if, I, if you take any of your permanent magnets and you heat it up enough, now your home oven probably doesn't go hot enough, but if you heat the thing up enough, you'll get a phase transition, okay? So you know, at some point that material is gonna melt, that would be a really high temperature. But even before it melts, if you raise the temperature on your permanent magnet, there will be a well-defined temperature at which, boom, the magnetism is gone and it's still in the solid phase. And then if you lower the temperature again, there'll be a well-defined temperature, the same temperature at which the magnetism, boom, comes back. And a, a change like that is a phase transition. So that's a phase transition between the magnetic and non-magnetic phases of what the electrons are doing inside of that material. So I, I study those kinds of phase transitions, the electronic ones. And there are, of course, many more phases that I've told you about. There's actually an infinite number. I proposed a new one a few years ago. No one's found it yet. It's called the vortex smectic C. So if any of you find it, let me know. <laughs> so what is that one? What is the, other than a title that's longer than I remember that fast, vortex something C. All right. What's a vortex smectic C? All right, so a vortex smectic, um, so first of all, uh, a vortex, how do I get that? If you take a superconductor of the right kind, there are two types of superconductors. We cleverly call them type one and type two. <laughs> so if you take the type two superconductor and you put a, a magnetic field on it that's strong enough, so bring a strong magnet near it, the superconductor will actually, um, go into a phase where it's, it's emitting little pieces of the magnetic field, but in quantized lines. So we actually call that, uh, their little flux quanta, we call it. But the, the important thing is that the superconductor will make little supercurrents that go in a cylindrical shape and trap a magnetic field line and pull it into the material. And then it'll do that again. It'll start from the edge of the, of the sample and it'll make a little cylindrical pattern of current and pull another field line in. And so each one of those field lines is we call it a vortex because the current is spinning in a vortex. So now those vortices can make patterns and they can make shapes. So um, Alexei Abrakosov a while back um, got the Nobel Prize for coming up with the idea that those vortices could make a solid, they could make a crystal. If the vortices themselves go into a regular arrangement that's periodic, that's crystalline, mm -hmm. it's called uh, the Abrakosov lattice. Now, um, one of the things that I proposed is that under certain circumstances, you could get a liquid crystal phase of those intermediate, you know, you could get a, a phase where it wasn't quite an abracause of lattice, but I called it an abracause of liquid crystal. You could get the vortex lines sliding past each other, liquid like in this direction, but staying in rigid sections from layer to layer. And so it was crystalline in one direction and liquid like in the other. So we called it a vortex spectic. I, and I know this is a much bigger question than you, than you could answer, let alone me follow. But um, how in the world do you theorize something like that? Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, um, well, you, ha you have an idea. And then the hard part is working it out mathematically, mm -hmm. right? 
So, so all together from idea generation to, hey, I think that might be happening. Well, you can't just publish that. That's not good enough. You need to back that up with a lot of uh, either mathematics that you write out by hand or computer simulations that you do, or some of this might look like theorems that you quote. Theorems are, are also go back to mathematics done by hand. Um, and you put all that together and you make a, a prediction. Uh, in the case of how did we predict this vortex smectic, um, so we had the idea, the physical intuition, right? We said, yeah, and, and to me, this is all very, uh, I, I picture everything. All of physics to me is diagrams and diagrams and diagrams. And I used to love drawing pictures as a kid. I did a lot of art as a kid. And so I use that all the time now to visualize physics. And so, you know, I could see the vortices in my head and I felt like, you know, if I think about how these vortices, when they start off in the abracosal lattice, they're rigid. And if I think about what happens when the temperature raises on them, they wiggle, you know, they wiggle, they wiggle, they wiggle, they wiggle, temperature raises, and then they become liquid. Well, I thought, well, if they weren't, if they didn't have a circular cross section, but if they had an elliptical cross section, I don't have anything that could display that for you. Well, maybe my hand, let's use my hand. It has a oblong cross section. So if you had vortices that were flat like this, then they would be more likely to slide past each other first this way before they slid past each other that way. So I started with that physical intuition and then I had a lot of work to do. So then I had to look up all the mathematics that people had, had used before to describe melting of vortices and then uh, rederive all that stuff under the context of them having this oblong structure, okay? So I had to do a lot of, you know, all together it took me maybe two years from, hey, I think this is happening to submitting the paper after having learned all the mathematics to describe it, extending the mathematics to my case, doing a lot of calculations, both on paper and on a computer, in order to show a few things. I wanted to show that the phase was a stable phase of matter and that it was likely to happen in certain materials. That, awesome. that is excellent to hear about how that process goes. And I love your comment on um, drawing you know, just, just drawing in general. I think that is such an important part of any science is that even if you don't feel like you're strong at, at your drawing skills, but that you can, I think something happens when you're learning that concept and you force yourself to either sketch it out or make some sort of, um, you know, some sort of, like you said, like a, a diagram or, or an illustration of some kind. Yeah. So, and, and for me, since I drew a lot as a kid, it's natural for me to draw these on pen and paper but you can do all sorts of other things. I mean, I've taught thousands of students at Purdue and we work on various kinds of visualizations. You know, I encourage them to draw things on pencil and paper, but if something is really a three-dimensional concept, we just use models that we can hold in our hands, you know? So we might pick up various objects and move them around in order to do it, or we might use a visualization on a computer. If you like doing that sort of thing, then you can, uh, there's lots of different ways with either a canned program or you can write your own stuff in, in code to do those visualizations on a computer as well. Anything that gives you that tool that you can manipulate either with your hands or with the mouse on the screen helps you in your, in your understanding. I'll never, I'll never forget the day that I was really confused about spherical coordinates. I was a junior in college at Caltech and uh, I, I, the spherical coordinates weren't working for me. So this is where you would define a point in space by saying um, you wouldn't do X, Y, and Z axes. You would say it's a certain distance from the origin and it's a certain angle this way and a certain angle that way. And so I was having trouble getting the mathematics to work out. And I'll never forget my teaching assistant took all this time to draw a diagram. And I thought, man, this guy's wasting my time. Okay, but he drew a really careful diagram on the chalkboard of exactly what these things meant. And when he was done, it all clicked for me. And I said, oh, I get it. And so from, from then on, I never got confused about it because I would, if I needed to redo it, I could just go myself to pencil and paper, draw the diagram really carefully, <laughs> right? And then it's like, when you do that, when you take the time to draw those diagrams really careful, it, it's almost like the mathematics just falls out into your lap. You know, there's, there's a rigorous way to go from your very careful drawing to the mathematical equations you write down, and it just all, all follows. Oh, Absolutely. I just love that, Erica. Thank, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and tell us about the research that you're doing and, and you know, just little techniques like that, like, you, you know, using that to 
graphing and, and illustrating, I think, to help us with that. That's, this has been really cool to hear about. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.